Well, first, I'd like to welcome you all back to An Achievable Dream. This episode is going to cover many of the nuts and bolts that constitutes vessel preparedness, which probably should have been part of our initial episode, as it is the first step if you are considering any long-range expedition cruise. Episode one was devoted to the navigational side of moving your boat up the California, Oregon, and Washington coast from Southern California to Vancouver, British Columbia. Part one and two of episode two is what needs to take place behind the scenes to help ensure that you can accomplish episode one in a safe, professional, and reliable manner. In part one of episode two, we discuss the importance of weather routing and the vital role it plays in taking your boat to sea. In this episode, part two of episode two, we cover vessel preparedness, which in terms of its importance, it is second only to weather routing. As with weather routing, there is no one best way for your vessel to be prepared or for this work to be performed. There are a lot of companies which try to sell prepackaged software to help you manage this task. Each of them takes a slightly different approach. All are of some value, and I have yet to find one that is fully comprehensive. Part of the problem is that no two boats are the same, and every captain looks at his or her responsibility a little differently, will set their own standards, maintenance routine, and attention to detail. I guess that as good a place as any to start this episode is to define why vessel preparedness is so important. We all understand why it is essential on submarines and airplanes and the need to have close to a zero tolerance for a failure in maintenance practices or procedures. One simple answer could be just self-preservation, but mostly it's our crew, family, and owner, if you're a paid captain, which will rightfully expect and assume that all captains hold themselves to the highest professional standards. Third is safety, peace of mind, and reducing the risk of an operational breakdown while underway. And finally, under the heading of professional pride, is that any job worth doing is worth doing to excellence. So where do we go to look for answers as to what is the best way to really know if you and your boat are fully prepared for an offshore passage? I started by talking to friends, other accomplished captains, and engineers who I both knew and respected. Fortunately for me, many of these individuals had either served on other ships, in the Navy, or in the Air Force, where training practices and procedures have been developed, tried, and tested for over a hundred years. What I learned can be summed up in just a few words. Check sheets, discipline, and attention to detail. That was really about it. One captain told me it was like baking a cake. Skip one ingredient or step in the process and the meal might end up in the garbage. Or looking at it another way, create a route with 50 waypoints, each of which were inserted for a reason. Then try skipping one or two waypoints and see how well that works out. Well, to be clear, the goal is to ensure that all main and auxiliary systems on board your boat are in good working order with minimal risk of breakdown while you are offshore. Accomplishing this objective is based mostly on common sense principles, and once you've developed your maintenance and service plan, it remains fairly constant year to year. Once you have the process established, it mostly comes down to having the discipline to prosecute the work so you can avoid serious problems. Check sheets are intended to keep us from skipping a step, to minimize human error and complacency, and to identify and correct potential problems before they exist while we are at sea. Discipline is what forces us to remain dedicated to staying connected and committed to the process. Detail helps keep us focused, observant, sets a good example for others, significantly reduces the chance of errors, and when you take a close look at your boat, you will see that it is little more than a collection of hundreds of details. For well over a thousand years, safety at sea has depended on vessels' preparedness. Any experienced captain will tell you that if you are out there long enough, the sea will find everything that you overlooked or did wrong. Ask any seagoing captain and they will confirm that this is a virtual certainty. 
Although you can rely on God to protect fools and children once or twice, if you don't develop good work habits and prepare ahead of time, you will find yourself calling Towboat US and or possibly reading about your misfortune in an after action report, which the NTSB will be only too happy to furnish you. Let's take a moment to review a recent incident. This is a real story and it could have happened to any one of us. Picture yourself cruising in a very remote area. It's a gray, calm, overcast spring morning. Sea conditions are favorable and everyone is looking forward to being off the dock and back to sea on an adventure. All systems are working perfectly. Everything seems normal, but five miles out of the harbor, an alarm suddenly goes off that says engine room fire. You glance at your closed circuit TV camera in the engine room only to see that it is filling with smoke and you have no idea what is happening. What do you do? There is nothing more deadly on board a ship than a fire. Well, this was us last month after 175,000 miles on Oasis and 28 years without a single breakdown. The odds had finally caught up with us as they inevitably always do. It took us almost 90 seconds to assess the situation that may seem fast, but when there is a potential electrical or fuel fire on board a boat, seconds matter. Before opening the engine room door, we needed to assess if we were dealing with a live fire or with smoldering electrical problems. Not seeing any flames through the engine room port light, uh, we felt that the risk of a backdraft by opening the door to the engine room was minimal. Smoke appeared to be billowing out from the aft area around the main engine near the transmission. Taking a couple of deep breaths, I entered the engine room with my mate keeping a close watch on me. Step one was to shut down the main engine, switch the battery disconnect switch to the off position and retreat from the compartment to see if the smoke would start to clear. It only took a couple of minutes to confirm that the smoke was clearing. So holding my breath for a second time, I went back into the engine room to see if I could determine the source of the smoke. Nothing appeared obvious. Grabbing an IR temperature gun, uh, within a few seconds, it was very easy to pick up that the starter motor, which was now at about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, was the cause of the problem. Lying in the bilge was the remnant of the six gauge quarter inch diameter copper wire, which had melted into the bilge. Copper melts at close to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We were now dead in the water and drifting. In order to regain propulsion and steerage, we needed to use our hydraulic take-home drive. The last time we used this system was while tied to the dock at Delta shortly after Oasis was launched 28 and a half years ago. Posted on the aft engine room bulkhead is our 20-step checklist for properly and safely bringing the system online. Having that checklist was invaluable, of enormous comfort, and it expedited the process, kept us safe, focused, and methodical while we went through the punch list to set up the system. It worked perfectly, and we were able to return to port under our own power. While we are on this example and under the heading of vessel preparedness, had we had oil in our bilge or oil coating the engine, this story would have had a very different ending. So if you are the macho sort of captain who likes to shoot from the hip, wing it, and make it up as you go along, then this video would not for you. If you want to take a more professional, time-honored, systematic, detailed, and disciplined approach, then keep watching. I can only speak to you from my own 50 years and 225,000 sea miles of personal experience uh, aboard both a sailboat and Oasis. It is not the right way. It is certainly not the only way. It just ends up being our way. And to that end, I am purposefully not going to provide any downloads or PDFs uh, because it implies that what we are doing would somehow be a template for you. It won't. This episode is purposefully entitled Vessel Preparedness, not Voyage Preparedness, because Vessel Preparedness is a precursor to Voyage Preparedness. So that means that we need both a routine maintenance checklist, which, when up to date, 
helps to ensure that the vessel is caught up on all of its routine maintenance. Think of this as your normal housekeeping chores. Voyage preparedness represents the additional things that we need to address before we embark on a long offshore passage. You can think of this as the additional chores that you would have to perform if you were having a large dinner party. We keep a routine maintenance notebook for each of the engines, stabilizers, water maker, hydraulics, deck equipment, tenders, through hulls, etc. to help ensure that we are on top of and in compliance with all necessary and required regular maintenance. This is essentially the manufacturer's minimum recommended maintenance procedures for each system, which we then supplement with such items as performing routine engine oil analysis, checking DCA levels in the coolant, periodic changing of relays and other components, exercising through hull valves, etc. This is extremely helpful to make sure that we are up to date with all our maintenance. Any systematic approach is certainly better than no systematic approach, and each of you will need to come up with your one that works for you and for your boat. So while we're on that subject, if you haven't seen a coolant or oil test lab report, here is a typical example of what the results look like for both an oil and coolant test. These cost between $30 and $90 a piece, and we perform lab tests at every oil change uh, and when it comes to the coolant, we start performing those each year after the fifth year to confirm that there are no concealed or undisclosed problems developing which we can't see. At every main engine oil change and every other generator oil change, we spend a good hour doing a detailed clean of that particular engine and the surrounding area. In addition to the safety factor of preventing an engine fire, this is what forces us to pay attention to the details, to inspect hoses, belts, look for signs of wear, chafe, to notice any new leaks, anticipate potential problems, and become familiar with the visual conditions of our engine so that we can quickly recognize a change in condition. Once the boat is fully caught up with all of its regular maintenance, we can now start to go through our voyage preparation checklist. We typically start this process six to eight weeks before departure so that we have time to take corrective action if necessary. Keep in mind that for us, when we talk about voyage preparation, we are talking about preparing for a voyage that will typically last five or six months and cover four to 6,000 miles. We will usually only go through this list once per season and thereafter we will rely on our standard one-page pre-departure checklist plus any items that we've noted on the engine room whiteboards and pre-start checklists. Going through this list is not going to be fast, fun, or easy, but it is certainly mission critical and what every professional captain will tell you uh, is an essential part of vessel preparedness. It is the captain's primary responsibility and it is ordinary, necessary, and an essential part of the job and what earns each of us the title of captain. You can't prosecute this work while watching the clock, talking on your cell phone, being on social media, or allowing yourself to get distracted, or to lose focus, or be thinking about other things. This is a tedious process and a laborious task, but it does require focus, dedication, attention to detail, and discipline. Here are a few of the indirect benefits of having and going through this and other types of comprehensive checklists. Our boats have gotten infinitely more complex over the last 20 years. The manual for our original 96 mile radar was about 30 pages long. The new replacement radar is 400 pages. If you have been off the boat for two weeks or two months, this is a great way to re-familiarize and reorient yourself with many of the systems on board your boat. It sets up an organized template to efficiently prosecute the work while reducing the chance that you will inadvertently overlook something. Pre-engine start and pilot house checklists are invaluable. If you are rusty, tired, rushing, or performing an emergency start by forcing us to stay focused, organized, and not to overlook an essential step. It is an invaluable training tool for crew to be meticulous and disciplined. In fact, 
Without a step-by-step -step procedure sheet, I can't see how you can teach anyone how to safely start or operate your boat. If something were to happen to you while underway, it serves as a terrific guide for another less experienced crew member to take over for you. Finally, the checklists help to combat the all too human trait of complacency. I'm amazed after all these years that just about every time these checklists end up reminding me of something I would have otherwise dismissed or overlooked. Developing these checklists is an iterative process and will likely be revised several times until you get them dialed in. So don't be too quick to get them laminated. As I say in every episode, uh, there is no one right or best approach. Each captain needs to make their own assessment, taking into account their boat, their personal expectations, aspirations, intended voyage, and level of competency of their crew. If you are planning a single extended offshore passage or multiple passages, the preparation, methodology, and approach still needs to be carefully considered, planned, and executed. If you don't, you are guaranteed to skip steps, risk missing critical details, and unintentionally put yourself, your boat, and your crew uh, in great jeopardy. We have been doing these voyage preparedness checklists for 28 years now, and we are still finding ways to improve, refine, and stay connected to the process. Before we dive in, here are a couple more tips in setting up your list. Uh, try to set your lists up uh, in an efficient manner to save time, to avoid making mistakes, or having to retrace your steps. Uh, use these lists as well to cross-train your partner or crew by being able to assign specific items or categories. Uh, consider using the far left column of the list for initials when the item has passed inspection and been completed. Uh, my longtime friend Milt suggested that I follow Winston Churchill's motto that a good speech should be like a woman's skirt, long enough to cover the subject and short enough to create interest. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to move through this list at a fairly steady pace with the idea that if any of this information resonates with you, you can pause and or replay those segments. Uh, in the interest of time, we will skip over most of the alarm and monitoring sensors uh, as they are pretty much boat specific and many of the items on this list are going to be self-explanatory. So with all our routine maintenance up to date, we can get started with our version of the voyage preparation checklist. Along the way, I will try to provide a few tips uh, that we have learned and share them with you. For us, the process begins with more of what I would call the administrative tasks. Item one is setting up a tentative itinerary so we have some idea of our departure date and when we need to complete the voyage preparation checklist. The itinerary also allows us to incorporate seasonal weather patterns, determine time and distances which will translate to anticipated engine maintenance, spare parts, fuel, oil, and filters. I will also use this process to start to block out tentative dates for guests and when we might want additional crew for offshore passages. All of this will come in handy later on in the process of determining ship stores and provisioning. Here is how we set up our itinerary. The spreadsheet is designed so that all we have to do is input the data in yellow, select the intended load generator, and the spreadsheet populates the remaining cells. In this example, I've only printed the last page of the itinerary, so you can see our total fuel, lube oil, required filter kits, and an illustration of the information we find useful. This is also a good time to review possible harbors, airports, and haul-out facilities that can handle your size boat. This information is noted in our itinerary and also copied over to our charts with harbors and their contact information shown circled in blue and haul-out facilities shown with red circles. The books and charts inventory includes the reference material you will want on board in preparation for your voyage, including 
up-to-date harbor and planning charts, pilot charts, sailing directions, coast pilot, cruising guides, navigation rules for the country or countries you will be cruising in. Reviewing your insurance might seem like an on item uh, for your checklist, but it's actually very important to carefully review your insurance policy to confirm the geographic limits of coverage, any exclusions, maintenance requirements, blackout periods, like during hurricane season when traveling on the East Coast, that it covers full or part-time crew, any licensing requirements for the captain, and if you are required to have a second licensed captain on board for overnight passages, etc. Another suggestion I would make is to quote a premium with a 2% versus 1% deductible. We have never filed an insurance claim on Oasis, but from what I understand these days, filing a claim, even if you were not at fault, will likely produce a cancellation notice, resulting in significantly higher future premiums. The point is that, irrespective of who was at fault, you will likely be better off to pay the cost of any damage less than about 3% uh, of your insured amount out of your own pocket than you will be to file a claim. Now, the next item is spot and EPIRB devices. These need to be updated each year, both in terms of your geographic cruising area, contact information, cellular, and satellite phone numbers. The generator pre-start checklist is used every time we start a generator. Developing some kind of checklist for starting your engines is essential. Although our checklist may serve as a rough guide, no two boats are the same, so you will need to develop a custom checklist that works best for your particular setup. It's a good policy to double check your voltage and frequency gauges on your generator before switching over from shore power to the load generator. While your generator is warming up, you can check that the alternator is putting out the correct charging voltage and that its voltage regulator is set correctly. Once your engine has reached its normal operating temperature, you can check the oil pressure and coolant temperature. It's a good idea to color code or mark all your gauges uh, to indicate the normal range. That way you can see at a glance if there is a potential problem. Since our meters are prone to failure and may periodically require replacement, we note in the top purple box the number of hours that need to be added to the current reading on the hour meter to keep track of the total engine hours. The number in the bottom label is a reminder for the upcoming oil change. The yellow cautionary note is a reminder to switch off our washing machine whenever it's not in use while we are running on generator power. The electronics in the washing machine are sensitive to voltage and frequency fluctuations. So even though you may not be using your washing machine, their electronics are still connected and switched on. We have learned from experience that it is best to keep that breaker switched to the off position unless you are connected to shore power or only when you are actually using the washing machine. Another tip if you want to extend the life of your generators is to bring cool air into your sound box directly over the windings to keep them under 130 degrees Fahrenheit. We mount a simple, reliable, and inexpensive analog gauge in an easy to read location as it is part of the watch standards responsibility to check this reading on their hourly engine room checks. We also have an alarm point set to 130 degrees Fahrenheit to alert us if we have a fan failure. The seawater strainer should be cleaned along with the transparent cylinder. We have drain ports with drain hoses connected to each of these filter housings to make them easier to drain clean and service. Raw water pump impellers usually last about 1200 hours depending on how much silt there is in the waters you are cruising in. Typically the water seal is the first thing to fail before the impeller. We do a visual inspection of the impeller at 1200 hours and thereafter every 600 hours. My suggestion is that you carry at least one or two spare raw water pumps if you are using raw water for cooling. 
Changing zincs is very routine. It's not a step though that you want to skip as you will eventually end up spending well over a thousand dollars to save three dollars on a zinc. Internal water pumps typically start to leak at about 3,000 hours, especially if your coolant chemistry is off. Otherwise, we have found that ours start to weep at about 7,000 hours. This particular pump shown in the picture has 10,000 hours on it and we closely monitor the leakage rate at each oil change. If we were headed overseas, this pump would be changed out. We centrifuge all our generator oil and perform an oil change every 300 hours and an oil and filter change at 600 hours. This works out to an oil change every two weeks. The site gauges allow us to monitor our oil and coolant levels while the engines are running. We also alarm low coolant along with high and low oil levels. If you don't have enough remaining hours on your generators to safely complete the first leg of your voyage, then you'll want to perform an oil change prior to your departure. Without a vacuum gauge, there is really no way to tell the condition of your fuel filters. We pre-clean our fuel before every offshore passage, which allows us to go 600 hours between fuel filter changes. Periodically, we need to clean the sight bowls of our fuel filters. This bowl is going to be very close to needing a cleaning at the next service interval. Belt wear can be seen by black dust, which is either an indication that your belts are over tightened or reaching the end of their useful life. This is another reason to use clean white absorbent towels under your engine. Air filters are a bit like fuel filters. There is no way to tell if your filters need to be replaced without a vacuum gauge or a manometer. Do not attempt to clean the filter that isn't designed to be clean, and even then, closely follow the manufacturer's exact instructions. Ignore the old wives' tale about holding it up to the light, uh, thinking that you, if you can see through the filter that it doesn't need changing. Uh, that's, uh, that is not the case. Northern Lights filters suggest that they be changed at about 600 hour intervals, which to us seems excessive unless uh, you have a lot of crankcase blow-by or are operating someplace around the Sahara Desert. We easily go 3,000 hours between filter changes. If you have a PTO on your generator for hydraulic power, you need to test the electrical clutch and fully load the pump. This could include running thrusters, deck equipment, uh, anchor, winches, and or take-home drive. As mentioned earlier in the video, we have a hydraulic take-home system. So I'll just mention again that if your system requires multiple steps in setup or operation, that you keep a procedure sheet in a handy location. This next item on the list is a reminder to do a careful overview for oil, fuel, raw water, or coolant leaks. Be sure to check hose clamps, Look for any evidence of chafe. Wipe down the inside and outside of your sound enclosure. Make sure all oil absorbent towels are clean. And if you have lighting inside your sound enclosures, which is something we would recommend, that they are working. While on the subject of hose clamps, you should try to replace any conventional hose clamps as they are inferior in just about every respect to the AWAB hose clamps. Another suggestion is to put silicone end caps on all your hose clamps. We went around our boat to test the tightness of all our hose clamps. To keep track of which hose clamps we had tested, we slid on a red end cap. We started off with 200 end caps, thinking that would be more than enough, and ended up at well over 400. You'll also need a lot fewer band-aids with these protective end caps. Another suggestion is that if you have a sound enclosure, either provide a large, well-lit access door for performing visual inspections, or remove enough panels before your trip so you and your crew can do a proper inspection on the generator while underway. We won't have enough time in this video to cover in any detail the methodology for how to test your automatic engine shutdown sensors, relays, or alarms. However, 
If I were a paid captain, I certainly don't want to be telling the owner that I assume that they were all okay. They should be tested once a season, unless you have analog sensors where you can see that the sensors are functioning and have the ability to set alarm points. The final inspection is to check your exhaust bellows, pipes, and blankets, cooling mixer, hoses, and mufflers for any signs of leakage. Next, we move on to the main engine. Developing a main engine pre-start checklist is as equally mission critical as the generator pre-start checklist, and we use them every time we start the main engine. The biggest danger here is complacency and skipping line items. I can tell you after 28 years, we occasionally still have to relearn this lesson the hard way. Since many of the items on the voyage preparation checklist for the main engine will be the same as they were for the generators, I will highlight just the differences. I do want to take a moment uh, once again to recommend that you mark all your gauges with the normal range of temperatures, pressures, voltage, and vacuum. We also set up our digital gauges so that when at normal pressure and temperature, all gauges point to 12 o'clock. If you have a single engine room air fan, then this may seem a bit obvious. Some boats, like ours, have multiple fans. In our case, we have seven reversing air intake fans to evenly cool the engine room, plus two generator combustion air fans and four exhaust fans, which makes it necessary to be sure that we put this on the checklist and that they are all functioning. For hydraulic fin style stabilizers, we want to check adequate raw water cooling flow, hydraulic oil level, pressure, and that the oil filter doesn't require changing. These systems are working continuously at high heat and pressure. Hydraulic cooling lines need to be inspected for leakage, chafe, and should be periodically replaced. If you operate in warm waters like Florida or the Caribbean, the raw water cooling lines and heat exchanger typically need to be cleaned at the beginning of each season. Stabilizers are always installed with removable, hopefully watertight hatches for inspection, servicing, and pinning the fins. We have replaced these hatch covers with thick watertight acrylic covers and have those spaces lit so they can be inspected each hour when underway. We keep an engine running log which gets updated at each hourly engine room inspection. This provides good historical data over time and helps to keep the watch standard present and engaged when performing routine engine room inspections. Here is another suggestion. Have a whiteboard in the engine room where watch standers can note any concerns or issues for the next watch stander coming on duty. Schematics are not necessary when everything is working, but are invaluable for diagnostics when something goes wrong. Drawing these schematics helps ensure that you, as the captain, really understand these systems, and they are a great vehicle for training your crew and or watch standers. Perhaps most critical is a schematic that maps out where all through hulls are located, so that every member of the crew is familiar with their location and their operation. Annual lubricating of all linkage also gives you a good opportunity to inspect these connections. Several years ago, a good friend of mine was docking at a seawall, put his boat in reverse only to discover that reverse would not engage. The boat did come to a stop when it crashed into the seawall. The single largest penetration into the boat is usually the prop shaft and its seal. Annual inspection is time well spent. We also have two temperature probes on our shaft seal and an alarm point set at 125 degrees Fahrenheit to alert us before any catastrophic failure. We use a Walker AirSap air filter. Uh, they provide a cleaning kit, which by following their instructions, you are assured not to unintentionally damage your air filter's integrity. Performing this annual cleaning and inspection gives you an opportunity to check your turbo for end play and to confirm that your CCV valve is doing its job. In addition, we have added a Raycor CCV filter in line with our AirSep and have been pleased with its performance. 
It also has a built-in indicator for when its oil air separating filter needs to be changed. Whatever emergency bilge pump system you have, it must be checked at least once each season. It is not enough to make sure that the pump is engaging or turning. You need to ensure that it is pumping. I've been on boats where the captain tested all his ship's bilge pumps. The pump light came on, it sounded correct. But when we retested them, two of these pumps didn't move a drop of water. That is about as frightening as it sounds and should be a good wake-up call to all of us. We definitely don't want to be testing those pumps when a compartment is flooding or worse, flooded. We use flow indicators on many of our pumps as a quick, easy, and positive way to remotely see if pumps are working. If your boat is over 12 years old, the next inspection is of your torsion coupling, which is concealed inside the bell housing at the aft end of your engine. This obscure component is a thick piece of vulcanized rubber or silicone, which connects your engine to your transmission. If this component fails, it's game over for that propeller. These couplings typically have a safe working life in the range of 25,000 hours or 10 to 15 years, or whichever comes first. This torsion coupling was well past its replace by date, but was still working. However, if we were caught in a storm or having to make a crash stop, there is a high likelihood that this coupling would have disintegrated and failed. There is typically a visual inspection port somewhere on your bell housing. My suggestion is that when your boat is over 12 years old, you should put this on your annual inspection list. Just as with the generators, Keeping the main engine bilge clean is essential to quickly identify problems like oil, fuel, coolant, or raw water leaks, or in our case, a piece of rubber coming from our torsion coupling, which is how we learn more than we ever wanted to know about these couplings. Another item you might want to consider is adding supplemental bilge lighting. Our goal in this section is to ensure that your batteries and charging system are ready for an extended offshore journey. It's quick and easy to confirm that your charging system is set correctly by looking at your battery's float voltage. If your batteries are relatively new, less than five years old, this is more than likely good enough. By year six, I would consider either doing a burn down test and or using a conductance meter to quantify the condition of your batteries. By carefully monitoring our battery's charging rate and flow voltages, we have gotten 10 or 11 years out of each set of gel cell batteries. One suggestion is setting high and low voltage alarms is a lot less expensive than having to prematurely replace your batteries. Air conditioning might seem like an unimportant topic for a voyage preparation checklist especially if you're on the west coast. But if you were cruising on the east coast, the Caribbean, or Mediterranean, you would prefer to have your toilet system fail than lose air conditioning. It might not be the end of the voyage, but it will be the end of your marriage until you get it repaired. Of greater importance than air conditioning is the inescapable reality that life goes downhill very quickly when you are out of drinking water. When you run out of water, you are running to port. Many boats these days have what we would consider undersized water tanks, which makes them even more dependent on a functioning water maker. These small wonders are expensive, fussy, and from our experience, the single most labor-intensive system in the engine room. You'll want to change your high-pressure pump's oil each season, lubricate Zerk fittings on the high-pressure pump's motor, check and change all filters. One suggestion I might make is that you consider changing out your high pressure lines on your water maker to a very high quality braided hose, provide extra lighting for doing routine inspections, get rid of any automatic or remote flushing valves, be sure to carry a spare set of circuit boards and contactors, provide a raw water flow indicator, have pressure gauges on all filter enclosures and have a seawater temperature gauge near your water maker.
The hydraulic cooling system could be for your thrusters, deck equipment, stabilizers, and or take-home drive. If you have a raw water cooling system, you'll need to inspect zincs and should consider installing a raw water flow indicator so you can confirm that your cooling system is actually moving seawater. You might think that if you are cruising in America that you don't need to be concerned about your fuel quality. At least I thought the same thing until 1993 when we took on a bad batch of fuel in Long Beach, California. We now pre-clean all our fuel for every long offshore passage and after wintering over in a cold climate where we might develop condensation in the fuel tanks. Another advantage of this type of system is that it provides a backup fuel transfer pump and if you have a diesel powered tender, the flow rate is better suited for that application of refueling. This next item on the fuel transfer pump is standard testing, inspecting and maintenance of your fuel transfer system. The high pressure pump is the heart of your water maker, so you'll want to consider carrying a spare. We decided to put our spare pump to work in a high pressure washdown system, which has worked flawlessly. Depending on how much this pump is run during the year, you should consider doing an oil change every year or every other year. A high pressure washdown system will cut your time for rinsing the boat in half. It uses two thirds less the amount of fresh water and it is twice as effective when it comes to rinsing the boat, cleaning the cushions, or washing off bird droppings, etc. The high pressure washdown system will do a far more effective job in cleaning mud off your anchor, your anchor chain, cleaning up the foredeck and hull, and uses only three gallons per minute of water. You'll want to order a blue non-marking hose, stainless steel quick disconnects, and an angled wand extension. Be sure to adjust the pressure down to under 700 PSI and to start with a 15 degree tip and a number seven spray nozzle. We test this system every time we start the main engine, since we also use our lube oil transfer pump to pre-lube our main engine. Depending on which source you believe, between 40 and 90% of total engine wear occurs within the first few minutes of starting a diesel engine due to poor lubrication. If you are looking for long-term endurance, pre-lubing is totally the way to go. Since you'll undoubtedly already have an oil transfer pump on board, what we are really talking about here is adding a couple of hoses and valves. This is also a good opportunity to double check your lube oil and waste oil tank levels. We note these results on a white working board in the engine room and will refill the lube oil tank when fueling a few days prior to our departure. The steering system is another mission critical system, so it pays to carefully inspect it for leaks, lubrication, chafe, pump motors, belts, linkage, your rudder angle uh, transmitters, the condition of hoses, note the oil level in the reservoir tank, and check the rudder post packing gland. If you are planning on spending an extended period of time outside North America, it is worth considering the investment of voltage frequency converters like the ones made by AC power systems. We have had a pair of their AC12 KVA units for 15 years and our experience has been that as long as you take care of them, they will provide flawless, reliable service to you. From a maintenance perspective, we carefully vacuum the electronics each year and check to make sure all six internal fans are in good working order. The big killer for all electronics is heat stacking, so we have temperature sensors with alarms so we can monitor each of these units internal temperatures and air condition the compartment when necessary. You may or may not have an air compressor on board your boat. Our primary need for this system is our air controls and air horns. We also use this system to fill fenders, tires, the accumulator tank, running air tools, and a host of other applications. This setup will be undoubtedly different on every boat. You may or may not have a backup freshwater pump, an accumulator tank, or a water filtration system. Whatever your system, you need to make sure that it is tested and in good working order. 
We are presenting here our procedures which you can modify to fit your system. Now here's a tip. Uh, if you have an alarm system, you might also want to consider a pump overrun alarm in case a hose blows off, your high pressure uh, cutout switch fails, or your pump burns out because the tank is empty or it loses its prime. Hydraulic systems are typically closed systems requiring their own reservoir tank of hydraulic oil. After 10 years, you should consider changing the tank's hydraulic oil filter and either replacing or lab testing the hydraulic oil in this tank. This is a general tank inspection and testing of your tank's oil level and temperature alarm. Each year, mark your oil level on the level sight gauge with a date to help identify any small leaks before it becomes a hose or a seal failure. In addition to checking each of your fire extinguishers pressure gauges, they require outside periodic inspection and servicing. You'll want to physically check that your engine room's automatic shutdown switch is functioning correctly. You might also have a rapid rise of heat sensor in the engine room. I don't know of any way to safely, reliably, or effectively test this sensor short of sending it into a testing lab. As far as your smoke detectors are concerned, they can be easily and quickly tested using readily available canned smoke. In this section, we are testing our bilge pumps. Boats don't do well when they start to fill up with water, and these pumps can spell the difference between floating and sinking, also known as life and death. Ultimately, we are testing to see if any compartments start to fill with water, if the compartments pump will do their job. All that little red enunciator light on the test panel is telling you is that the power is being sent to the pump motor. It doesn't tell you if the motor is working, if the suction line or its filter are clogged, the volume of water your pump is actually pumping, or if you have a diaphragm pump, if one or both of the diaphragms have failed. There is only one real way to test these systems. It's to grab a hose and put water in that compartment at a rate that simulates a reasonable flooding condition. If you are going to go to the trouble to test your bilge pump system, you should perform this test unambiguously and run each bilge pump for at least three to five minutes. If the pump is going to fail, this is when you want it to happen. Here are a couple tips. Have a separate float alarm sensor in each compartment. And two, be sure to mount the alarm below the pump switch, otherwise your flood alarm will only go off when the pump can no longer keep up with the flow of water into that compartment. On Oasis we have 10 tanks and we determine the level in each tank by using a tank tender system. This system is simple, mechanical, virtually maintenance free and continues to work after 28 years. We have one of these in the pilot house and one in the engine room. Testing this system takes only a few minutes. We have a pair of these Edson pumps developed for the Army back in Desert Storm, and neither one has failed once in 28 years. The maintenance consists of one pump of grease per year. Shut off the pump and fill the tank to test the high tank alarm switch. Switch the pump back on to test the high level pump switch and confirm that the annunciator lights are working. If not already installed, consider a crossover manifold allowing either pump to evacuate the gray or black water tank. Space permitting, put a viewing port in at the top of these tanks, which is helpful for doing a visual inspection. When it comes to the hot water heaters, we are testing the pressure relief valve, the hot water recirculation system, all the plumbing, hose clamps, and looking for any leaks. If you want to dramatically extend the life of your hot water heater, drain and flush your heater every two years and replace the zinc anodes. In terms of through hulls, after learning the hard way, we now exercise all through hull valves twice a year. It's a lot quicker, easier, and less expensive than having to change one of these valves out. As mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to also produce a diagram showing their location around the boat. Same as with the through hulls, this is a super helpful label to put on your plumbing 
uh, with its contents and direction of flow. Using a high quality polymer wax and polishing the stainless will extend the life of your paint and make washing and rinsing the boat about four times quicker. If your boat is painted, do not use any wax or products containing silicone. Here are the main products we have been using for the past 15 years. They are expensive, but well worth it. Hatch gutters and deck drains can get clogged with dirt, debris, pet hair, spiders, and other debris. It takes just a moment to clean and flush all these drains. And I can tell you from our experience that it beats the alternative of flooding a compartment with salt water. Checking batteries is important, not just to make sure that these items are still working, but to check to ensure that the batteries have not started leaking. In recent years, it seems that Duracell batteries are not made as well as they used to be. After replacing several keyboards, flashlights, testing meters, a Bose headset, TV remotes, and almost losing our night vision scope, we have discontinued using them and are now using EverReady batteries. Removing salt from your searchlight mirror or reflector will go a long way to extend its useful life. Lubricating all Zerk fittings displaces any moisture or salt, and for warping winches, it is the primary through deck water seal. Check any pulleys, shivs, anchor roller, swivels, or bearings to be sure they remain moisture free and are working freely. It's important to remove the winch drum and to lubricate the Zerk fittings on the shaft collar. Here is what a winch gearbox might look like if you neglect this step. It takes several days to pre-clean our fuel, so we start this process usually about a week before our intended departure. This is also an ideal time to make a point to cycle all your fuel from any unused tanks so you don't end up having stale fuel sitting in a tank in case you end up having to use it on your voyage. Vacuuming your refrigeration's condenser coils and cleaning the heating and air conditioning cooling fan blades to increase these units' efficiency extends their life and reduces the possibility of mold buildup. It's also a good excuse to perform a visual inspection once a year of these otherwise overlooked spaces and compartments. Over time, clothes dryers build up a significant amount of lint around the outside of the drum and inside the enclosure, which can present a fire hazard if left unattended. Depending on how much you use your dryer, the dryer vent needs to be periodically swept clean. If you are not living on board your boat, then running a quick test of all galley appliances will give you peace of mind and likely be appreciated by all. Same as with starting the generators or main engine, we go through a detailed pilot house pre-departure checklist before leaving the dock or lifting the anchor. The last thing you want to be doing after untying your lines or departing a busy harbor is to realize that you don't have steering or the correct chart. Just a few quick thoughts in terms of bridge management on software updates and a couple of tips. Our suggestion would be that you disable any Wi-Fi and or internet connection uh, to all of your navigational equipment. If your system is stable and working for you, updating the system will create more problems than it will solve. If your system permits, back up your configuration files. Create a master NEMA configuration and navigation electronic setup spreadsheet so you have documented the setup programming on your systems. On several occasions, having this information handy has saved us and gotten us back up and running in short order. Unless you are under 40 and an IT specialist or you don't have an integrated bridge, I suggest in the strongest possible terms that you try to document how your electronics are interconnected. The same is true for understanding how your autopilot is wired, especially if you have your chart plotter integrated into your autopilot. If you can't document them, then you probably don't understand how they are wired and you won't be able to troubleshoot problems. Here is how we have documented our systems. On the NEMA drawing, we also note each component's configuration setup, input and output sentences. This is a great winter rainy day project 
and is invaluable for both diagnostics and or if you want to add or modify equipment. As captain, it is your responsibility to establish your ship's standing day and night orders. You'll get into trouble if you run a loose ship and not setting up clear guidelines in advance. Women watch standers tend to be the best. They will generally wake the captain up, where a lot of my male friends can wait until we have a TCPA of two minutes before asking for help. I've had people reading with the lights on at night and staring at their iPhones so they have zero night vision. 25 years ago, we used to think that the person going off watch should be responsible for making sure all the electronics were properly tuned and adjusted. That worked until we had one watch stander who turned the sea clutter all the way up on our primary radar. I came on watch at 3 a.m. and didn't see any targets or threats until 3.30 when I saw the running lights of a 700-foot freighter crossing our bow with no targets appearing on the radar. VTS maps, weather maps, and VHF channels were already covered fairly well in Episode 1 and in Part 1 of Episode 2. Until recently, we used to hold a safety briefing for each new set of guests and to follow a safety briefing checklist. These 20-minute safety briefings could easily morph into 60-minute sessions, depending on the number of guests, level of interest, and questions. We discovered that even with a checklist, every safety briefing was different, with some being more thorough and comprehensive than others. If you have a couple joining the boat, where one is going to be participating in the ship's operation by, say, standing watch, and the other was joining as a guest, these briefings were either too short or too long. We often need to get underway immediately after guests arrive, meaning that there was no time to give a safety briefing. And for an active ship with engaged guests, it was simply too much information for anyone to comprehend and integrate after arriving on a long journey to the boat. We ended up preparing two videos, one for guests and one for guests who are going to be standing a watch. This has been a game changer and well worth the short investment of time up front to prepare the video. We have guests who join the boat each year and even they appreciate the opportunity to re-watch the videos to re-familiarize themselves with the boat. If you are interested, you can find these videos on the website of An Achievable Dream by typing in youtube.com forward slash an achievable dream. We also post on the bridge any vessel traffic surface areas, their boundaries, lanes, and VHF communication channels. Preparing your crew's foreign entry forms ahead of time makes sure that everyone's passports aren't going to expire within the statutory six months of entry into many foreign countries and to any possible visa issues. If you, as the owner, are not on board the boat, then you will also need letters of authorization uh, for the acting captain. There are at least half a dozen different formulas for how best to lay out your watch standing schedule. We initially started with four hours on and eight hours off, but quickly realized that was too long. For the last two decades, we have settled on three-hour watches, and here are a few alternative watch schedules which we have tried. As discussed in our previous episodes and earlier in this episode, preparing an itinerary is essential in weather routing, planning gas and crew schedules, making reservations, provisioning, fueling, and allocating time to perform needed maintenance. As detailed in part one of episode two, on a practical guide to weather routing. We will prepare ahead of time a weather contact and recording sheet for each offshore portion of our passage. We chart out every accessible port along the offshore portion of our route. If we have a dramatic weather change, a mechanical problem, or medical emergency, we want to have these escape routes mapped out and fully charted ahead of time. This charting needs to be carefully and clearly laid out on your charts. 
Imagine a situation where you as the captain were to become incapacitated. We use one color for our intended route and a different color for the escape routes. The emergency contact information sheet is a two-way street. It provides instructions to crew for dialing out along with emergency phone numbers and instructions for family and friends to reach the ship. If you read accounts of disasters at sea or the NTSB reports that follow, one recurring theme is that deck equipment, tenders, jet skis, or kayaks come loose and end up inside the boat and not by way of using a door. If you have a heavy tender like we have on Oasis, having good tie-down hardware means that You'll use them all the time, and these toys will remain secure. The last place you want to be in a storm is out on deck trying to wrestle a crane, davit, jet ski, or tender back into its cradle. After 10 years of not really addressing this issue properly, we ended up buying three of these with shard adjustable backstays. They have proven themselves to be a great investment. This solar section is pretty much self-explanatory. I would point out that the U.S. Coast Guard puts out a safety compliance checklist. It's a good reference list for you to use and helps if you ever get stopped and inspected by the Coast Guard. You'll be sure to be in compliance. Having a master spares inventory is a great way to document how you prepare for any type of trip, what items you need, their part numbers, vendor, contact information, cost, and most importantly, where you stored them on board the boat. We carry surprisingly few spare parts on board Oasis, yet our list has a shocking 1,125 items on it. For example, we carry between one and 20 spares for each type of bulb. However, we have 44 different bulbs, from the oven to the washing machine, navigation lights for the boat, its tenders, searchlight, floodlights, overhead lights, bilge and locker lights, flashlights, engine room lights, and even our vacuum cleaner has a bulb. If you are headed almost anywhere outside of North America, you will need to carry spares for all your AC lights, plumbing, screws, nuts, and bolts, as most other countries use the metric system and a different voltage and frequency. Depending on where you are cruising, you'll need to consider spares for your heating and air conditioning, hydraulic, water hoses, an array of plumbing fittings, adapters, fasteners, electrical connectors, wire, oils, lubricants, sealants, adhesives, tape, cleaning supplies, washer and dryer parts, water maker spare parts, paint, engine and generator spares. Organizing and planning and preparing this list takes an enormous amount of time, but once you have done a good job of thinking it through, it will make all future trip planning and provisioning much easier, faster, and you'll do a better job of being sure to have what you need on board and to know where to find it. Your medical inventory needs to be based on your particular needs, that of your guests, crew, and where you will be traveling. If someone on board goes into anaphylactic shock and you don't have an EpiPen, there's a good chance you'll lose them. If you have older people on board, you should consider carrying oxygen and an AED defibrillator. Our master medical list has about 170 items, broken down into prescriptions and non-prescription items. It's important to note the expiration date, so you don't run more than about a year past the date, and to identify where these items are located. If you have a pet on board, they too will need their own list of medical supplies, grooming products, and safety concerns. We carry about 15 prescription items for our dog, Serena, and use a 24-7 app called AirVet, which actually saved her life earlier this year. Updating your weather routing as you approach your departure date was covered in part one of episode two. DC bulbs typically fail when they are switched on. Once running, they almost never burn out. This is why you see so many commercial boats leaving their running lights on 24-7. We have found that LEDs do not burn out, however their DC electronics do burn out. So unless you want to be climbing the mast while underway, I'm still a believer that you are better off leaving your running lights on 
until you are back in port. This is a good time to provide visual access to your stabilizers and to ensure that the compartment is clean and that the lights are switched on and working. We lay out our abandoned ship procedures with an overview of what initiates the process and follow with the assignment of four teams responsible for its execution. Team number one is assigned to whomever has the galley responsibility. Team two is assigned to whoever is best qualified to serve in this capacity. Team three is responsible for manning the radio, issuing the distress call, and maintaining communication watch. And the fourth team will be assigned to those most capable of serving as the launch team. This may seem like an obscure point, but can make a huge difference to the success of your passage. Your gray and black tanks are typically vented to the atmosphere at a point well above the pilot house. If you don't have P-traps in all your drain lines, then every one of these drains also becomes a vent to the inside of the boat. P-traps can get sucked dry over time by water sloshing in the tanks, by the vents, or P-traps being undersized, or when it comes to the condensate drains in your air handlers through non-use and evaporation. We put this on the checklist so that we don't forget to pre-charge the air handler P-traps, pump the tanks, run the showers and sinks for a few seconds, and refill the P-traps before departure. Now that we are within a day of departure, it's time to make sure that everything has been stowed and secured. Depending on how your galley refrigerator is plumbed, the humidity levels where you are currently cruising, you might want to vacuum out any water that has accumulated in your condensate tray. It's a good idea to do a walk through each stateroom and double check all port lights are securely dogged. This is also a good time to perform all the initial steps for engine pre-checks and to get your bridge navigational equipment up and running. My suggestion is that once you have completed your pilot house checklist, you leave the electronics turned on and in standby until your departure. Just prior to your departure, we have a list of common sense reminders just to make sure that we don't accidentally, in our rush to get underway, skip any steps. Well, just when you think that we were all done, I've provided a few other checklists and forms that we use and have proven useful over the years. I'll leave these with you as a future grist for the mill. The bottom line is that successfully completing these voyages in a consistent, safe, and professional manner is not based on chance, hope, or prayers. It requires a passion for excellence, professional pride, attention to detail, mental discipline, and it doesn't hurt to get lucky. Developing these skills and applying them in a consistent fashion isn't possible if your approach to vessel preparedness is based on memory or attempting to reinvent the process for each passage. Using checklists, applying the rich history of lessons learned from those who went before you, and coming up with your own well-developed systematic approach is the legacy passed on to me, which I now pass on to you. Coming up for us next in episodes three and four will be much more of a photo expose on cruising the magnificent splendor of British Columbia and the last great frontier of Alaska. This is the real reward for all your hard work, dedication, commitment, and why you have endured the countless hours of planning and preparation. You won't want to miss either of these two episodes. By subscribing below, you will be notified when they're released. We thank you again for joining us and investing the time to watch our videos. Please feel free to provide any comments or ask questions below as we really appreciate hearing from you and any feedback you care to offer. Wishing you all the best for the remainder of the summer. Stay safe out there and we'll catch you again in late August or early September. Bye for now.